this legislative forum is for the, the public to provide an opportunity, uh, the, the opportunity for the public to, uh, to express concerns and to offer input about what they uh, may have concerns with in the legislative uh, session that's starting a week from tomorrow. Uh, and so we are, are looking forward to, to, uh, to visiting with you tonight. It's very encouraging that we have a, a large group of folks here with us. Uh, we're going to start out with, um, in just a moment with an invocation that's going to be led by Associate Pastor Ted Amy of the Asbury United Methodist Church. And then we're going to have a posting of the colors by the Johnson High School Marine ROTC. And this includes Cadets Butler, Cadets Dangerfield, Gibson, and Phillips. And these, uh, th these cadets are under the direction of uh, Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant. That's as high as they get. Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant uh, Everett Hodges. And uh, Red Hodges was one of my platoon leaders when I was a young Marine many years ago in, uh, in, in places far, far away. Uh, so I'm very, very honored to have him with us tonight. So if you'll please stand, and then we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll please stand while we do this. Pastor Amy. Post the colors. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please take your seats. We're going to start this evening uh, by allowing our, our introduction of our legislators. We're going to work from my right, so we'll start with Representative Mac McCutcheon. I'm going to ask each legislator to briefly share their name and give a general description of your, your district uh, where you represent in Madison County. Representative McCutcheon. East Limestone over to Morrisville Road. Thank you. I'm Tim Melson. I have State Senate District 1, which is uh, the vast majority of Lauderdale, uh, over into Limestone. Comes up 72 uh, on both sides of the road till you get to Browns Ferry Road, then mostly north. Then it goes to Athens, 
up to Ardmore, Elkmont area. And then over in the Madison, I have the uh, uh, Bobo area down to uh, J.L. Johnson area in Alabama A&M. Good evening. My name is Laura Hall. I represent House District 19 on the uh, east side. We have Alabama a and <clears throat> go all the way out to Henson Hill on the west side of uh, Oakwood University. We travel north on Jordan Lane up to uh, Tony uh, Sparkman High School. Uh, Jim Patterson, I represent District 21. It starts to the north at Hazel Green. I have everything in Hazel Green from the parkway over to Butter Day Road, which is about half of uh, half of Hayes Green High School. Uh, I got about two thirds when you count Meridianville. I had the entire Meridianville zip code is in my in my district. I had the majority of Morris Mill. I have uh, quite a bit of uh, of the Mount Carmel area and uh, the Riverton area. Then they go across the mountain and pick up all of Chapman, uh, all of uh, Five Points, all of Blossomwood, the area I call Randolph over there north of of uh, of uh, uh, Drake Avenue from the mountain to the parkway everything on north on Drake Avenue is in my district so it's a you know and plus Montesano Mountain I have about 55 percent county and about 45 percent city it's a unique district that I have some of the largest farmers in the in the state and then I have downtown Huntsville in my district Clay Schofield Senate District 9 I represent southeast Madison County New Hope owns crossroads and South Huntsville, everything east of the parkway up to Mountain Gap Road. I also represent all of Marshall County, Northern Blount County, and Western DeKalb County. Thank you for coming. Mike Ball, District 10. I've got about the southern two-thirds of Madison. My, uh, the uh, western border is the Madison-Limestone County line. Southern border is the Tennessee River. I have the Redstone Arsenal. Uh, I've got South Huntsville, uh, most of South Huntsville, uh, west of the parkway. Uh, then on farther south, uh, you, I've got Ditto Landing, and, and then it goes up, and I've got all of Green Mountain. And I'm Bill Holsclaw, State Senate District 2. <coughs> uh, my In Madison County, the, the district is the limestone Lauderdale, I'm sorry, the limestone Madison County line. I used to go all the way to Lauderdale County. I pulled back now. Uh, but it's that, that county line, county line road there. Uh, up to uh, uh, Oak Grove Thatch, and then I come across to Highway 53, Jordan Lane, come all the way back down to around uh, into, into Huntsville, uh, and then I-565, Highway 20, is sort of the, the bottom line coming across. I do drop down and represent a, a majority of Redstone Arsenal as well. Thanks for coming, everybody. My <clears throat> name is Phil Williams, House District 6. It begins at the Bridge Street area and goes through Research Park, Providence area, and then it kind of fans out into parts of Monrovia and Harvest, all the way up to Ardmore, and then now with this new districting across the county line into Limestone County. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Daniels, representing District 53, new district in Huntsville. Uh, south, uh, Martin Road South, uh, all west of the parkway, north of Sparkman Drive, um, half of downtown, the other half of uh, Jimmy Patterson's district, and northwest to Old Monrovia and 255. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Steve Livingston, Senate District 8. Um, our district starts at the Georgia boundaries and goes to Tennessee and comes up to about the Flint River, goes into southeast Huntsville, um, then around Mountain Gap to Weatherly and across the parkway and goes to uh, Farley and Chaffee and English Village County. I'm Howard Sandiford, House District 20. My district's a little easier to describe this year. Uh, it's everything south of Drake and east of Memorial Parkway except down to Ditto Landing. It's mean, that includes Hampton Cove, Mountain Gap, Jones Valley, and all of those areas. I'm Paul Sanford. I represent Senate District 7, and my district encompasses Laura Halls, Jim Patterson's, Anthony Daniels, Howard Sandiford's, and just about the rest of Madison County that you didn't hear any of these folks uh, touch. So thanks. Okay, well, it's going to be my goal tonight to keep us on track. So here's going to be the, uh, the, the procedure that we're going to follow. And before I go into that, I made a note I, I didn't do. Uh, I want to welcome our new legislators to this, uh, to this forum tonight. So this is, uh, represents a little bit of a growth. If, if you're uh, uh, reached to coming to this, our annual meeting, we do have some growth here with uh, some of the new members of the legislative delegation. 
but the procedure we're going to follow tonight is first, as a courtesy, I ask that you uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, I don't know if anybody still uses a pager, but it says pagers. Uh, and other electronic devices. So, so please do that uh, as a courtesy to others. We ask that you limit your input to matters that are state, county, and local issues, not federal issues, unless a bill must satisfy some federal requirement. Okay? Uh, we ask that, um, uh, so we'll have time to hear from everyone. I just looked at it. We have about 40 folks that are, that are signed up to speak tonight. If you are signed up to speak for something and someone else is also signed up to speak on the, on the same topic, when, they, when you hear your name called and you kind of have the same topic, feel free to just go to the microphone and say, ditto what that person said, and we'll know that we have multiple people here that are passionate about the same topic. Okay? We, we're, our, our intent is to hear from as many of you as we can over the two hours that we've laid out and uh, allowing us to, uh, to move through this so that we do have that interaction. Uh, so please, please keep that in mind. When you are called to speak, please go to one of the, the microphones. We have one directly in front here, and then we have one over to the, the side here, over to your left, uh, that we'll be using tonight. We do have a, a, another microphone. If you're kind of trapped in an aisle, uh, we do have a microphone that, that Becky uh, will be able to, to get over to you uh, and be able to utilize as a third microphone as needed. Uh, I'm going to try to kind of stack us, so I'm going to call a couple of people to each microphone so that we'll have folks to be able to flow through uh, as we're moving along. Uh, we're going to ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, uh, Representative Phil Williams is going to operate the clock for us tonight, and uh, we'll, we'll be guiding that. Over on the side here, you'll see the lights come on. This is the same system that the Huntsville City Council uses, and that's going to help us flow through the process. Uh, so as you see the lights come on at yellow, and it'll be green, and it'll go to yellow, and then it'll go to red. When you, when you see red, we, we, uh, we need you to go ahead and wrap up your comments. Uh, I'm going to let you go and finish your thought, but, but my intent is to try to keep us on track. Uh, legislators may comment on an issue, and, and legislators, if anyone has a question on an issue that someone or you want to ask a further question or maybe make a statement, just chime in and let me know, and, and I'll recognize you, and we'll be able to do that in an orderly process. Uh, we're not going to, this is not an opportunity to poll the delegation about what's our favorite color or, you know, other things that you may, may have concerns with. So it's not an opportunity for you to <laughs> poll us on certain items. Um, and we're going to respect everyone's time uh, and, and get us out of here by, by promptly at 9 o'clock. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Cheryl Patterson. Patterson. And by the way, I will tell you, uh, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Well, they all introduce themselves, but, but Anthony Daniels, Anthony Daniels, that's a new legislative district uh, that, that was created through the redistricting process. Uh, Senator Tim Melson uh, came over. Uh, through the redistricting process as uh, the growth of, of the, uh, uh, the county caused us to have to kind of readjust things. So those are the two. And, well, Steve Livingston's a new face in the delegation. My apologies. See, this is where I get on a slippery slope. We have new districts that came in, but we also have some new faces that were elected. And mention Richie Horton. Who can't be and, and Richie Horton is, is also a, a new face. But anyway, Steve Livingston um, is newly elected uh, to his, sen his Senate district uh, coming in on, on Jackson County side. Uh, and then Richie Horton from Madison County is not going to be here this evening. Uh, his daughter was involved in the uh, 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 fireworks factory explosion, uh, and so he's not with us this evening as well. Okay, so we're going to keep on track. Uh, I do have most of the, or about half the alphabet in my last name, uh, so I will struggle with some of your names tonight. That's my apologies. I will do my best. I'm going to start with Cheryl Patterson, and she is going to speak to us about taxing defined pension plans. I'm going to ask Regina Dalton. Uh, speaking on, on Carly's Law and Medical Cannabis to be on deck here. Is she here, Gina? Am I saying that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then I'm just going to, once you're down, I'm going to kind of flow back and forth so we got an on deck. And uh, you're on, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Thank Patterson. you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Cheryl Patterson, and I am the president of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Uh, we usually call ourselves NARF, you know, Federal Employees. We always have an acronym. So we are NARF. And it stands for National Active and Retired Federal Employees. Uh, we, I am the president of the Huntsville Madison County chapter, and I am speaking today uh, opposing and asking all legislators here to oppose any state taxation of defined pension plans, which were mentioned by Governor Bentley as one way of raising revenue. Uh, there are approximately, well, there are 27 chapters of NARF in Alabama, and there are seven chapters of NARF in North Alabama. And our mission, NARF's mission, we are a national organization, in part, is to support legislation that is beneficial 
to our current and potential employees and to our potential and current federal retirees and their spouses and to oppose any legislation that is contrary to their interest. We are concerned about Bentley's, Governor Bentley's statements to raise st state revenue by taxing defined pension plans. There are approximately 108,000 federal retirees and employees in the state of Alabama and within the fifth legislative district of Alabama there are approximately 34,000 retirees, federal retirees and employees. These citizens have already paid and are paying Alabama income tax and sales tax, but they're paying Alabama tax on their salaries, which includes their retirement contributions, and contribute significant economic impact and revenue to the state. Alabama has long found that it is in the public interest not to tax pension payments. If Alabama begins taxing these pensions, we will see federal retirees and employees that will seek states where there is a friendlier tax environment for retirees. Uh, the Huntsville-Madison County Chapter of 443 and the Alabama North State Federation, which includes all 27 chapters, strongly oppose legislation to tax its members' pensions, and we ask that you, if you do have this come up in your legislative session, that you will strongly consider our concerns. Thank you. Thank Do you, you have Ms. any questions? No, ma'am. Thank I you. I gave each of you a package of our NARF magazine and some of our, what I have spoken here. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Um, Mr. Tim Smith is on deck and Ms. Gina Dalton. Hi, my name is Gina Dalton. I'm the mother of two and a half year old Charlotte who suffers from a catastrophic form of epilepsy called DeVray syndrome which has given my daughter diminished quality of life and has potentially shortened her life. Last year, I pleaded with you to help my daughter by passing Carly's law, and the Alabama legislator passed the law unanimously with Governor Bentley signing it almost a year ago. While Carly's law was a wonderful victory for Alabama families with children with epilepsy, our victory has been bittersweet. You see, despite the efforts by you, we are still waiting for UAB to start. For the past year, Alabama mothers and fathers have continued to watch their children suffer, and many more families have moved, moved to legal states. Families such as the Swans, who have left Alabama in order to seek medical help in states such as Colorado, continue to be cut off from their families here in Alabama. Some families have split entirely, with one family living in Colorado, the other living here, maintaining the rest of the family in their job. This is no way, way for a family to live, and this cannot continue. Families are meant to be together, not apart. Last year, I stood here and tearfully begged for your help. I was told by everyone that you would not listen to me, that you'd never pass Carly's Law. It was an election year. But you did listen, and you heard, and you acted in such a powerful way that I'll never be, able, I'll never be done saying thank you for taking on such a bold initiative. Today, I'm back once again pleading for your support. UAB continues to battle the federal approval process before the study can continue. I continue my fight with our federal representation with multiple state, regional, national <clears throat> awareness groups to help our children here in Alabama. I need your continued support. Please ask our federal representation to consider initiatives which will remove the DEA as a barrier for new therapies and reschedule medical cannabis. I'm here to ask for you to be open to continuing legislation concerning Carly's Law. If the UAB study that you created and funded cannot start soon, please consider passing legislation that would legalize, that would recognize the difficulties our families face. A good example of how you could help would be what Utah state legislation passed, providing reciprocity with Colorado's law regarding CBD medicine for children. This allows parents from Utah to get the CBD medicine that they need so de desperately without fear of prosecution in Utah. This means that Utah families have access to medication now that they do not have to split up their families and they can return home. The new federal legislation defunding the DEA as a barrier for families who are worried about prosecution traveling across state lines should no longer be an excuse for state legislation concerning reciprocity. Once again, I'm overwhelmed by your support. And I'm already, um, your support you've already given to families such as mine. I can never thank you enough for what you've done for all of us. I'm only here asking for your continued support. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. And one thing, one thing that I just want to add, where it's at right now, uh, we passed Carly's Law. We appropriated some money for the study for, for those children to get some relief. 
Uh, it's been a, a long bureaucratic slog. We've got DEA approval. Uh, all of all of the, there's one hoop left, which is which. I mean, we've got FDA approval. Those acronyms get me confused, and and we're waiting on DEA approval, and we're expecting it any day. So we're almost there. I have one question for you. Uh, uh, Charlotte is your daughter's name, yes, sir. right? What was the first name that she learned? Uh, Mike Ball. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be prideful or nothing, but I'm more proud of that than anything <laughs> that I've ever gotten since I've been in the Alabama legislature. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Duck. I'm sorry. Yes. Representative Hall. And I was trying to make sure I was clear on the reciprocity. Yes. So Utah is able, they are able to have how is they, how, the logistics of how they're able to um, get the, the uh, medication are they the, ordering it from Denver? I mean, Colorado. No, the the families are going to traveling to Colorado and crossing state lines um, in order to get the medication and come back. There are no residency requirements for CBD high CBD hemp oil, so anyone that goes into Colorado can get the high CBD hemp oil without being a um, citizen of that state. So the since Utah borders Colorado, families just drive over and pick it up. I see. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? I was just going to make one comment. So you're telling me that you want medical marijuana, and you cannot get it because of the, uh, not the FDA, but the the uh, DEA, right? DEA. It's the CDC. So and they turn a blind eye to the not, to the to right. the state of Colorado breaking the federal laws out there, but they won't let somebody that needs it for medical purposes to be allowed to have it in Alabama. They won't let you have a low THC version of medical marijuana, which is a high CBD, low THC. So the DEA is even further blocking things by not allowing a low THC product that won't get anyone high or psychoactive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hannah Ellis, you are on deck. And Mr. S Tim Smith, go ahead, sir. Thank you can you use the microphone lady. up front if you're not. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, lady and gentlemen, for uh, allowing all of us to be here and have, uh, allowing us to have input with our legislators. I'm uh, Tim Smith. I'm the pre acting president of the Alabama Family Rights Association, ALFRA. For 18 years, this group's been in place trying to affect, positively affect, the way that family law is dealt with in the state of Alabama. All of you know we're dealing with a fiscal crisis in the state of Alabama. I think, and our group thinks, and I think if you look at it, you'll realize we are reaping what we've sowed for the last 40 or 50 years and how we've dealt with our children when it comes to respect of family as far as both fit parents having input in their life and both families having input in life and both families supporting those children. If you look uh, at what we deal with now, we've got prison problems. We've got crime problems. We've got social problems that go with that. We've got unwed birth at a record high. If you look at a lot of other things, tonight when I was coming here and looking at these children back here, it makes my heart bleed almost. One in four children in the state of Alabama are living in poverty. So what can we do about that? Uh, we can have a lot of task force. We can have a lot of people look at problems. That's been going on for over 20 years. I've been watching this problem myself for 18. And we've got a family law task force in place now, and I don't think we're going to get anything productive out of that that's me speaking as, as the state president of the Alabama Family Rights Association. One of the things I'm going to ask of you, and the first thing I'm going to tell you is we're going to bring some legislation forward, and we're going to put it in front of you legislators to deal with these problems in a real modern-day way. We've got socioeconomic problems that we're dealing with daily because of how we've dealt with families and how they go through the divorce process. So, let's not think like we thought 40 years ago or 30 years ago. Let's come up with some positive ideas. We're going to bring those forward to you. Pardon me, microphone. We're going to bring those forward to you. We're going to lay them on your desk. We're going to bring them to you in Montgomery during the session. And we're going to ask for your support. And in fact, we're going to demand your support because we've gone too many years of just pushing this ball down the road. Now it's impacting the whole state. We've got all of society supporting children because we've taken parents out of their life, fit parents out of their life. 
I want to thank you once more. Look forward to seeing me and other members of Alf Alfred down in Montgomery. We're going to be there in force, and we're going to bring legislation to you, and we expect your support in that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mary Witherspoon. Yes, ma'am. You 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 will be on deck. Go ahead, Miss Ellis. Well, good evening. Can you all hear me through yeah. this one? Uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. And I just want to talk tonight about actually um, House Joint Resolution 379. Um, according to what I have record of, um, Representative Ball and Hall and McCutcheon and Williams, Patterson, a number of you signed on to this resolution. And I don't know if you remember, I know there's so many things, it's hard to keep track of everything by number in the session, but this particular resolution really concerns me and my family, and I want to tell you why. It's uh, the resolution that was passed to make cornbread the official bread of Alabama. <laughs> And um, it? it really concerns me. Maybe cornbread does signify Alabama because I've stood up here many years politely and begged with tears in my eyes. And I've learned sadly that you can choke on cornbread just like you can choke on Alabama politics. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned very I sadly that something as good as cornbread can be used to say, bless your heart, to a neighbor. But see, in the South, bless your heart doesn't always mean bless your heart. It's the kind of thing that you have to say to a legislator who tells you he'll sponsor your midwife bill and then goes to the committee chair and tells the chair not to bring your bill to a vote. Bless your heart. And tonight, I just have to look up here at this platform and think of all the people that took the legislative time and energy on this resolution, and it was quite long and good flowery language, no pun intended. Um, but this was a resolution that I don't recall any of us asking you to pass, and I feel like you made cornbread a bigger legislative priority than the mothers and babies who it's supposed to feed. I've been coming to legislative delegation meetings for years, and I just don't recall any citizen in the room asking you to work hard to make cornbread the state bread of Alabama. <laughs> I do remember for years families asking you to free our midwives. And I just believe that Alabama midwives deserve the right to eat their cornbread at home with their families in peace. So I just want an amendment to this proposed joint resolution. I feel like we can work together and come to a compromise and all enjoy our cornbread. My proposed amendment is this. We resolve that henceforth and forevermore Alabama midwives be free to eat their cornbread in peace without risking prosecution for helping mothers and babies. Because I can't enjoy my cornbread if my midwife isn't free to enjoy hers. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Um, Bill, I'll make a quick comment. Okay, uh, Representative Patterson has a comment. Um, I've worked on this bill two or three years, and I've been, I've been in favor of the bill, but I just want to be honest with you. Until we can get, I'm not saying this is right, but until we can get Blue Cross Blue Shield and Huntsville Hospital happy, the chances of this bill getting passed are slim to none. You're going to have to work with David Spiller, so you're going to have to work with, 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 with uh, come up with some compromises there uh, with those groups. Uh, we have a pretty good contingent of people from our area because we have a lot of people in North Alabama that want midwifery. But you get past North Alabama and past Birmingham and the interest falls way off, you know what I mean? And they're more, more aligned to vote with Alpha or with the, you know, with the hospital association. And I, as your friend, I'm just telling you, you've got a lot of work to do there. Okay. Thank you. Um, on deck is, uh, is, is Isaiah Ashy? Ash. 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 Uh, Ms. Witherspoon? You're on, you're, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Mary Witherspoon. Most people, and I expect most of you, agree that predatory lending corrodes uh, our society. When people lose their homes, uh, lose their cars, because they cannot pay 
the up to 456 percent annual interest that payday lenders can now lenders can now charge. Uh, there is something immoral about the uh, our society, and this is something that the legislature can regulate. Uh, last year, there was before you a very modest proposal uh, to set up a database so that payday lenders uh, could obey the law, check in, and make sure that they were not giving a loan to someone who had just taken out uh, a loan. Uh, and incredibly, uh, this bill uh, did not pass. Uh, so uh, I'm here uh, to urge you uh, to pass legislation that would cap the interest rate at 36 percent. It sounds like a lot, but it's certainly a lot less than 456 percent. So I ask you to cap the interest rate on payday loans and title car title loans and also uh, to support a bill similar to the one that was before you last year uh, to set up the database that will enable uh, the uh, payday lenders to be held accountable for obeying the rules that are now in place. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Witherspoon. Um, Jason Summer, am I saying that correct? Yes, sir. You S U M M or is that M M E R anyway? How is it pronounced? Sumner. Sumner. Okay, it's an N. My apologies, uh, Mr. Ash. Go ahead. Okay. And, and uh, Mr. Sumner, you're on deck. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Isaiah Ash. I represent the Madison County Team Captain for American Alabama Citizens for Constitution Reform Foundation. We have 66, 67 uh, teams throughout the state. My issue here tonight is to concern with the rewriting the. Uh, 1901 Constitution. All of the issues that we are faced today hinges on the Constitution of 1901. I'm going to give you just a short, brief history of what we have, what has happened in the past, and where we are today. We have an unfinished business from the defunct Alabama Citizens Alabama Constitution Reverse, Reverse Revisions Commission that left the legislature in an uncertain position last year which needs to uh, tackle the rewriting, uh, removing the racial language from the educational article. In 2003, Governor Bob Wallace, I mean Bob, Bob Raleigh, set up a 30-member, 30 38-member commission to reform the 1901 Constitution. From the commission recommendation, the legislature in 2004 approved Amendment 2 on the November ballot to remove the racial language. The amendment was defeated by a narrow margin of 2,500 votes, where ouster Chief Justice Roy Moore and the Alabama's Christian Coalition had called the amendment a tax height, a red herring diverting the minds from the real object. In 2011, the legislature appointed a 22-member panel for the Alabama Constitution Revision Commission to rewrite the article-by-article article approach to the 1901 Constitution. On November the 12th, on November the 6th, 2012, Amendment 4, Education, Amendment 8, Banking, Amendment 10, Corporation, were described as outdated, ob obsolete, archaic words or language. Amendment 4 was the only amendment defeated by the voters over 61%. The defeat hinges on the phrase, no right to education, where the Democrats and the Alabama Educational Association would not support. In 2013, Revision Commission tried again to replace the language with these words. The legislature shall establish, organize, and maintain a system of public education throughout the state for the benefit of children thereof provided that nothing in this section shall provide a judicial right or obligation. The statement was somewhat similar to Amendment 4 in 2012, where the commission approved to a 9 to 7 vote. Yes, sir. If you'll, if you okay, was that the time? Yes, sir. Okay, if, in if you can wrap up your final thought for us. Okay, in conclusion, 
I would say the legislatures are aware and the voters know that race and religion have always set this state apart through social and economic heritage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, is this uh, Chuck, is it Vidane? Vidane. Vidane. I'm going to get it. Uh, Mr. Vidane, you're on deck, and uh, Mr. Sumner, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, um, my name is Jason Sumner. I'm a uh, voting citizen of Harvest, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2013, my neighborhood has been uh, been accosted by a uh, on a nightly basis from 4 p.m. until 5 a.m. by a local business on Old Railroad Bed. The main issue at hand uh, is excessive noise keeping up homeowners as far as 1,400 feet away. Um, there are secondary issues, which I'm not going to address today, but we approached, we approached the business owner on several occasions, and he was unwilling to cooperate. So we moved forward to talking with Phil Fandiver and uh, Sheriff Dorning, and uh, they've done everything in their, in their power to help, help the citizens of, of Harvest. Um, but the issue that we have, again, is an issue with the state constitution of home rule. The county does not have any ability to control the, you know, what goes on in Madison County without going through and getting an amendment passed by the state. Um, so I'm just here. Uh, I know that there was a bill last year that was uh, that got tabled because it didn't go through the process quick enough, and I believe that's resurfaced as Senate Bill 16. Now, I know that addresses a lot of uh, county personnel type issues, but it doesn't actually address uh, the complete reform of, of home rule. Um, so I'm just asking everyone here to, to help the citizens of, citizens of Madison County control their own destiny without seeking the approval of everybody in, in the state of Alabama. Th thank you, Mr. Sumner. Um, as, uh, have you, have we contact, have you spoken with me? Have we contacted? Uh, I, I have emailed you in the, in the past. Um, okay. And it's really just been an issue of going to the county. And the county has, has said that it's not something that they're willing to do. Yeah, well, it's very unlikely to have it passed. In, in working with this through Limestone County, I've uncovered some old legislation that, that exists. Um, let me, let, let's get together again, please. Okay. Do you have my you have my contact information? I will. I'll okay. Okay. Thank you. And we'll get together. Uh, on deck is uh, uh, Tony Goolsby. Go ahead, Mr. Bedane. You're right. <laughs> uh, Chuck Bedane. It's been a long time. I want to talk a little bit about, about tax reform. Uh, uh, not a lot of details, but because uh, it's been some time since I've delved into this with uh, any great big amount of detail by reading Susan Pace Hamill's thesis on uh, on tax reform, which she came out with uh, several, uh, a few years ago. Um, so let me just let you know that I and others in uh, in the area have a, a heart are heartened by Governor B uh, Bentley's statement and his move to try to put uh, tax reform on the uh, uh, in the public domain and before the state legislature. And we'll be anxious to see what's in the details of that because that's always uh, more revealing than the generalities. But to say no new taxes is just a phrase that boxes everybody in because uh, everybody knows in any kind of a closed loop system, if you change one parameter or one function, that it's going to affect the others. So, a case in point of trying to remove taxes from groceries, which is a much needed move, uh, that's going to cause taxes to go up in some other area if it has to be revenue neutral. Uh, so, somebody is always going to be able to say that they're raising taxes if you alter anything. Uh, the way the system uh, works. Consequently, well, some taxes are fairly easy to change, uh, others more difficult. Sin taxes versus property taxes is a case in point. Um, some taxes you have more latitude to make changes, some taxes you don't. Some require a constitutional amendment. Uh, of course, in our race to have a constitution with a thousand amendments, that might be a good deal, um, a, a good stroke. So let me just say in closing, many are encouraged by Governor Bentley's announcement. We're ready to try to uh, look at what the details are and be supportive in any moves that you have for trying to make change. 
and I hope you'll work with him in good faith and bring us a, a, a tax system that is exchanges that rebalances the um, regressive positive feature or regressive um, progressive p features of the uh, of the system that we have right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tony Wright, Ms. Tony Wright, you're on deck. Um, Mr. Goolsby, go ahead, sir. Yes, first off, I'd like to thank God for allowing me to be born an American citizen and especially uh, giving me <laughs> the state that I'm a citizen of, the great state of Alabama. I thank God for that. I appreciate the opportunity to get to uh, speak to y'all, and um, I could probably go on for hours and hours and hours about my concerns about our education in Alabama. But since I just have three minutes, I've decided I'm going to try to give you a brief uh, statement about how Common Core and specifically the comprehensive counseling and guidance part of Common Core education is affecting my life and my family personally. I know we don't call it Common Core anymore in Alabama. We call it Alabama Career and College Ready Standards. That only changed when they started catching a lot of backlash when Common Core came out. Very quickly, they started playing with words and came up with something that sounded better than Common Core. We've had repeal bills two years in a row down there to repeal the Department of Education's vote for Common Core. This last year, it was called a wedge issue, and it, it was an election year. So Dale Marsh and Mike Hubbard said that it will not be brought to the floor for even debate, let alone a vote. It's a wedge issue. Uh, our children <coughs> deserves better than that. I've got a granddaughter I've had ever since she was born. She's 17 years old. She's 11th grader. She's made straight A's all of her life. She's in private school. Uh, she's dual enrolled this year in a college. She's taking college classes. And... Uh, so we've had control of what she's being taught as far as morals and values and uh, respect, different things like that, having her in a Christian private school. But now that she is dual enrolled in a uh, public college, she, they gave her an assessment on this new part of the Alabama education uh, plan comprehensive counseling and guidance state model of Alabama public schools they gave her an assessment uh, a company called Cooter Incorporated without my knowledge without my wife's knowledge and uh, my wife was a registered nurse for 40 years at the same hospital up there where Senator Livingston is from, Scottsboro, Alabama. She worked in the same hospital for 40 years as a registered nurse. Mr. Oglesby, the timer went off. I'm going to ask you to wrap your comments up so we yes, can be sir. respectful of everybody's time. She grew up around nurses and doctors and everything, and she decided uh, a long time ago that she wanted to be an anesthesiologist. She's been observing in the OR and stuff like that for the last two summers. Now that the college gave her this uh, uh, assessment and everything, they've already started telling her that she needs to be thinking about some other career path that me and my wife has spent probably $100,000, $200,000, and she's been dedicated to this one objective her whole entire life. And Common Core doesn't think that's the right uh, pathway for her. Repeal Common Core and do something for our children in the state of Alabama and have some backbone. 
quit calling things a wedge issue. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Protect Mr. our children. Mr. Olmstead? Yes, sir, you're on deck. Go ahead, Ms. Wright. Um, I'm just, I'm not representing any group or anybody. I'm just Vicki Voter here. And, um, but I do talk to a lot of people who have been somewhat demoralized with the way our government's been running, state and federal. But um, anyway, and I live in Senate District 2, House District 6. And, um, and I just have a do and don't list for you that I would like to see um, maybe this legislative session. And I'm going to start with the don't list. Um, no more Agenda 21 language in the legislative amendments, laws, bills, et cetera, such as strict scrutiny or sustainable anything. Because this language, people aren't educated enough, or I don't know, they don't know enough that this language puts an unfair financial burden on the hardworking, tax-paying, registered voters of the great state of Alabama. Um, the other one, number two, do not pass legislation or amendments that rob the oil and gas trust fund. As you know, most of the dividends from the trust fund go into the general budget. The more money that is taken out, the less goes into the budget. I am painfully aware of the budget shortage of the, of the state of Alabama. Um, but the state of Alabama has a Republican majority in the legislature. It is time you all started acting like Republicans. Those of you that are Republicans, please start acting like Republicans and clean up the fraud and waste that exists within the government agencies. So you, don't, so you do not have to raise taxes and financially burden the hardworking, tax-paying, registered voters of this state. And most of all, do not let governor, our governor strong-arm you into capitulating to his threats. Number three, no more guilt language in the amendments. That is that if, if this bill doesn't pass, the sky is going to fall. Again, you are Republicans, please, your Republican majority, please act like it. Now, the do list. Support or create legislation that supports humane treatment of the animals, namely dogs, cats, and horses in both Madison County and the great state of Alabama. Animal cruelty has got to stop. Animals outside right now, there are dogs chained to their houses with no cover other than just maybe a tarp. That's still going on. We're, we're, we're at 32 degrees. They don't have water in their dish. They have a cube of ice. And, they, and yet there's nothing, nothing these animals can, there's no recourse for these animals because we don't have laws to, to give it to them. Okay, number two, support or create legislation that decriminalizes midwives in the great state of Alabama. Currently, a woman has two choices in ending her pregnancy, give birth in a hospital or terminate in an abortion clinic. Let us give our mothers a third choice by allowing midwife-assisted home births. It is a real shame that those who choose not to birth in a hospital have to travel to another state. Now, if it is a matter of safety, plenty of babies have been successfully delivered on the side of a road by police, state troopers, paramedics, firemen, et cetera, even in unsanitary conditions. I don't see how a planned home birth is any worse. If it is a matter of income for practicing obstetricians, decriminalizing midwifery will not hurt their paychecks. Legalized abortion is what is sucking the OB's potential income down the drain. And, I, and no doubt, there will be way more abortions performed than assisted home births. So going after midwives is silly and unnecessary, and it's time for Alabama to, um, to be, be brought into the 21st century. And then number three, now, re repeal Ms. Common The buzzer went off, so I'm going to ask okay. you to wrap, make this one brief, please. Wrap your repeal Common up. Core. I definitely disagree with the, their definition of critical thinking. Thank you, and good work on the cannabidal oil. Thank you. Mr. Jackie Reed, you are on deck, ma'am, and Mr. Olmstead. <coughs> Go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is Greg Olmstead. I'm the president with North Alabama Educators Credit Union. Uh, Ms. Witherspoon had talked about my topic earlier tonight, so I'm not going to re repeat anything that she's talked about. Uh, I'm really, though, here in conjunction with Alabama Rise and really the, from a basis of faith and fairness about this payday lending issue. And I kind of thought it would be interesting that for you to know from an internal perspective, I've been in banking now 28 years, be 29 years this year. And I can't think of a single product to consumers that's worse product for the consumer in terms of, of basically, uh, you know, keeping them in a hole and, and, and staying there. And I'll give you an example. You know, we have, most people have payroll deduction, direct deposit. And we had a member who teachers get paid 
you know, about once a month. So her money was coming in, and within a week, that money was gone. In fact, she was in a negative because she was, you know, going through us. And we were, I, had, I had asked her to come in because we need to try to work that out where we didn't have that situation. And this woman, we could tell because we see the, the uh, drafts come through, she had three of these payday loans that she was out there using. Again, the law is you're only supposed to have one at a time. As was discussed earlier, there's not a way to monitor these things. So, you know, when we're talking about how to change this, getting into, I would try to avoid uh, uh, dealing with the number of loans and all that stuff because there's not a good way to monitor that. I think as was discussed earlier, the only way to really do this fairly, and, and to me, if you can't make money in an institution, any whatever it is at 36%, uh, you shouldn't be in the business, to be honest with you. I mean, 456% is morally bankrupt. And I feel like the legislature, Alabama, is legally enabling that. I mean, you have set that up to where you say it's okay. You know, we have laws after hurricanes and tornadoes. You can't overcharge people for this or that. But yet here we, you know, we sit here and you know, let them do this. And, and I just think that something needs to be changed. And I know this has been kicked around for several years. But I would just ask that as you have different uh, legislation or proposals come to you, let, let's try to get this changed. I mean, other states around us have taken care of this. There's no reason why Alabama should be set on the sidelines when you have states, Florida, Georgia, and Arkansas around us, and they've taken care of this. Uh, and, and it's really hurting the low-income people, and we have a largely regressive tax structure anyway, so let's see if we do something with, with, it, th with this, we'll be helping them too. So I would just really ask your support on trying to work with the interest rate issue and not the, the number of loans and that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I think this is, this is Mr. Thomas. I think it says John Thomas. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so you're on deck. Go ahead, Ms. Reed. Thank you. I'm more at home over here at this microphone. This is my home every Thursday night almost. Anyway, I want to thank each one of you for allowing us to see you and know who you are and all the new legislatures. And thanks to all the people. I've never seen this many people in the council chambers. Hold these people accountable. That's what we elect them for. Anyway, I want to thank you for letting the people get involved and for all the things that you do. There's too many concerns over our country and st state. It's making too many wrong changes. We need to hold each one of you accountable for what's going on in Montgomery. I believe the Accountability Act and Common Core was handled too fast and too quick without public knowledge, and whoever wrote these things up didn't let people read them long enough. I think the, the lawyers that make these up for you, I don't think you're reading them close enough. I just really don't. Bentley, he comes forward after an election, says no taxes, and he wants each one of you to tax. Somewhere out there, he wants you to tax. You don't need no more money. We gave you the rainy day fund. You get the gas reserve funds. These people voted you three times to fill your pockets full of money down there. I didn't vote for none of them because I know you're going to waste it anyway. And I don't know what you're doing with the money that you're doing down there. I don't understand it. And retirements, just people, does not need to be taxed. They've done their time. They work for that money. You don't need to take any of that. I'll hold each one of you accountable if you come to take their money away from them. And if you up our property taxes, I'll still be looking for you because, <laughs> no, you're wasting money. These incentives and these jobs are good. We give this one 70 million, we give that in 100 million. You never ask any of these developers to lay any of the money on the table. Jobs are good, but these people and me will not never see none of that paid back, and they'll pull out within 10 or 20 years, so stop it. Jobs are good, but make these developers, the mayor does the same thing, make these developers lay the money, some of it up front, because they got some bankers behind them somewhere, hold them accountable. And you know, we talk about Democrats and Republicans, and I've got to say something about God. When God comes and gets each one of us, he's not going to take time out to ask you for Democrat, Republican. <laughs> he don't care. Do what's right for the good of all the people. That's what I want you to do for these citizens. We're all of God's people. We're holding you accountable. Do good. I love every one of you, and thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Wait, wait, wait. 
the light. I got one but, second. One second. Well, now, we, we reset when the I clock. When I see 450,000 prisoners coming out down in Montgomery, golly, stop it. We don't need them running loose anymore either. Thank you. Now, Jackie, I was about to compliment you on finishing before the time went out, and then you went back and did a redo. So I can't compliment you on that. Okay, Mr. Thomas, uh, you're, you're on, uh, is it Richard Gibson? Mr. Gibson, you're on deck. Go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Yes, I'm just, uh, I'm not representing anybody except myself as a citizen of the state, and uh, I know there's been some discussion about, um, I know one man was very, very concerned about poverty, and he was talking about the family and so forth, but I'm really, I, from what I understand, education is truly the way, at least historically in the United States, how one people can, can you know, get out of poverty and into the middle class and forward, because we've always had a, a society that's been, been mobile. I mean, that's the design of the United States. And I'm just concerned about uh, the Alabama County uh, Accountability Act, and uh, I don't know if it's succeeding or not succeeding, and I don't know how you all evaluate it as to whether it is a success or not. And um, so that's, that was really my concern, because I mean, it's, just, it's such a controversial bill. I mean, you're taking money away from public education, giving it to private schools, and, and expecting uh, you know, poor people to be going to these private schools, and, and that's not, the case. That's not the, the case in terms of availability of private schools in all counties of the state. And, and some of the schools, of course, can refuse uh, you know, the, to, to take the, the poor people. So uh, I'm just concerned about that in terms of the future of the state, in terms of having a, 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 a properly you know, educated public so that to make, make the state uh, you know, uh, improve. Um, so I don't know if there's any, any thought about amending the bill or repealing it or, or at least providing some information about whether it's successful or not so that people can know whether the policy is, is proper or not. So that's really about it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Um, is it it's C R E A G E R Krieger? Am I saying that right? Krieger, Mr. Krieger. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Gibson. You're on, Mr. Krieger. You're on deck. All right. Thank you. In 1958, an FBI special agent published this book called *The Naked Communist*. What he did is he outlined 45 goals by communists inside this country, what they wanted to do to this country. These goals were read before con the U.S. Congress and is now a, a record of the U.S. Congress, and it was done in 1963. I'm going to read you three of these goals, this relevant common core. Number 17, get control of the schools, use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum, get control of teachers' associations, put the party line in textbooks. Number 28, eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principle of the uh, separation of church and state. Number 41, emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Attribute prejudices mental blocks and retarding of children to the suppressive influence of parents. You ought to know by now where Common Core came from. It came from Chicago, it came from Bill Ayers, who is a Marxist and a big supporter and also confidant of the president. It's previously known as the Annenberg Challenge. Common Core is an all-encompassing system to indoctrinate your children move them on a pathway that they, it might not be of their selection, and it's also to collect data on your family to be utilized in the future for whatever they want. Okay, it's, ex it's supported by some extremely large corporations. Microsoft is one of these because they stand to make hundreds of billions of dollars off of the implementation of these programs. All right. This spy system is going to condemn your child to a life of misery if they don't score well enough in, their, in the area that they're interested in. You as our legislative representatives need to put a stop to this. No matter how much money Washington, D.C. dangles in front of the state of Alabama to implement this program, you know that sooner or later the state is going to be paying for 100 percent of it because the government never, ever keeps up their promises. So it's up to you to defeat this stuff. Let's go back to funding our education systems ourselves and having our own standards. We don't need some bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. telling you where your children are going to work for the rest of their lives. Thank you. Okay, Mr. 
Mr. Krieger. Hello, my name is Charles Krieger. Give, give, me, give me one okay, second. Thank you. I got to get somebody on deck. Okay, sorry. George Berry, you're on deck. Mr. Krieger, go ahead, sir. Good evening. My name is Charles Krieger. I wanted to thank uh, everybody for coming here tonight, taking their time out of their schedule and providing this forum. Uh, I just want to make a, a few brief comments. There are going to be other people here speaking on Common Core. I'm here to urge repeal of Common Core. I believe it's a federal takeover of education, as the other gentleman commented. It's Obamacare for education. It interferes with parental rights. I don't believe it was thoroughly examined before it was passed. And it seems to be taking twice as much effort to repeal it as it did to get it passed in the first place. That's all I have to say. As I say, other people are going to be speaking to this issue, and these are just comments. But I'd urge you all to repeal Common Core. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. I can read the first name, Stephen, but is it Case, C-A-S-E, Stephen Case? Mr. Case, you're on deck. Go ahead, Mr. Berry. Thank you. Again, you've had a lot of people speak on an issue that is dear to a lot of people's minds on, in their hearts, and that is Common Core. I don't want to reiterate anything you've heard here because you've heard one of the best speeches I've, I've seen on this and, and heard on this. But this issue is not going to go away. What happened with the legislation, I don't know what happened years ago that we and the legislature refused to address it. Because the legislature refused to address it, we are here continually talking about it. And we will continue to talk about it because we're parents. Because what you just heard is the federal government and the, our school system taking away control of parents of how their children will be raised and the path that the parents will choose. This is what we see. This is why we fought it four years ago, two years ago, and we'll continue to fight it. We fought back then the AEA because they were having control. Because we saw more socialism coming in our nation. What we're seeing now with Republicans and I being one, is fascism coming in, of the corporate control of our schools. And one of the reasons I'm going to bring this up is what we're going to hear from the legislature in the future of this session is you talking about charter schools. Now, charter schools is one of the things that the Common Core folks want. Now, we're hearing also that that's going to be a solution. But what charter schools is going to bring in is more corporations like the Bill Gates, like Bob Riley and his charter schools, Jeb Bush. And this is a form of fascism of our education system. <coughs> what I want to just bring this to our attention is that if we don't address it now, this, guys, this is not going away because you're affecting our children and you're affecting our grandchildren. And you have passed the buck for two, three, four years saying that this is not your responsibility that is the responsibility of the Board of Education. Guys, we didn't elect the whole Board of Education to do this. We elected you to do it. The Constitution says the state legislature is to establish, maintain an education system in the state of Alabama. So we're here before you again, and we'll be here next year, and we will be here the year after that. We'll be here until 2020 and 2030, trying to correct the mistake the direction of where this country is going because, and I'll quote one guy, and the time is up, Mark Tucker, who is one of, the, who is one of the architects of Common Core, stated just recently in a ward that the, his biggest hindrance with Common Core that it's not going fast enough and the biggest hindrance to Common Core is parents. That alone tells, tells us what they want to do. They want control of our children and not our parents, having that control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berry. <laughs> Charles Orr, you're on deck. Go ahead, Mr. Case. Good evening. My name is Stephen Case. Um, some of you I know. Some, most of you I don't, though. Um, I've been a man of service since I was 17 years old, uh, fighting in the forces of freedom and the American way of life, um, served in several wars, uh, low-intensity conflict around the globe. I've never been afraid uh, that my nation would lose, and I've never thought for an instant that I was on the side of the good guys. Um, then uh, one evening I had uh, dinner with Casey Warinski, a fellow grad from West Point, uh, and, and after my discussions that evening in, a, in that private dinner, my wife looked up at me and said, we are going to homeschool. 
Uh, we pulled our children out immediately and we started watching what was happening to our neighbors' children. We started researching Common Core and uh, so you understand, I don't know most of these other folks who've talked on Common Core, but we have not, but I do, I would like for any of you who are against Common Core to stay afterwards so we can, so we can uh, coordinate better, but uh, Common Core is uh, the largest tro Trojan horse this nation has ever seen. It, it smokes Obamacare. Most of us are against Obamacare, but tr Common Core is the biggest Trojan horse this nation has ever seen. It is bringing in, it is ushering in the opportunity to strip children away from their parents and teach children that their authority is not God or their parents, but it is government. It's the same tactic that the Bolsheviks did. It's the same tactic that Nazis did. Uh, I, I'm being a study, uh, a student of history, uh, I have used that knowledge to help write uh, national security policy and, uh, and, st and strategy uh, for the global war on terror. I understand how to write strategy, and I'm telling you that Common Core is a strategy. Um, I would like to sit with any of you, any of you who will take this serious, and I think you will start taking it more serious now that the science portion of the Alabama Common Core is starting to unroll. And they're teaching now uh, that uh, th things like the theory of evolution is not theory, it's fact. And children now have to prove it as fact in, in their studies. Things like that you're going to see start unfolding. And so many of you who are voted in by people like me are going to get a lot of pressure by the people like me when they start realizing just all the evils that are encompassed in Common Core. Um, Senator Schofield, you are my, rep uh, my senator. I've not sat with you yet, but I would like to spend time with you and just go line by line on each of the things that we have found, the facts that we have found in the Common Core for Alabama specifically. I'm not talking about the nation, I'm talking about Alabama. I have a lot of pride in this state. This is where we're rooting. Uh, that are of grave danger to the future of our children and consequently to the future of our state. Um, but it, it, Karl Marx said, we, we spoke about Marx and, uh, and the, the communists that, uh, that infiltrated our nation back with progressivism and now and even into this century, early a uh, few decades ago, Marx did say, if you give me education, you give me the nation. And that's exactly what's happened under Common Core. Um, I've, I've spoken to some of you, uh, you know, shake your heads. I, I, know, I know it's not all of you are taking notes uh, tonight, so I'm not going to get into the details, but I would like to spend time with any of you who will listen to the details that I will show you in black and white what it is doing, what you are allowing to happen by not repealing it. So please consider repealing Common Core. Thank you. Thank you. Gail Williams. Ms. Williams, you're on deck. Go ahead, Mr. Orr. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, I am a, uh, uh, in the Christian uh, Citizen Task Force, which is a discipleship ministry of White Whitesburg Baptist Church. I speak tonight as an individual citizen, but if you will endure, I would like to uh, read to you a resolution passed on Tuesday, November 11th, 2014, by the Alabama Baptist State Convention. Whereas Alabama Baptists hold fast to their obligation before God to train up their own children, Alabama Baptists who place their children in public schools expect to be able to provide meaningful input into their children's total education experience. The state of Alabama has entered into an agreement with the United States Department of Education called Plan 2020, which is problematic. Plan 2020 requires the adoption of Common Core standards. Plan 2020 requires the implementation of assessments not written by Alabamians. Plan 2020 requires curricula aligned with the standards and assessments which contain material that are offensive to Christian values and American exceptionalism. Plan 2020 requires non-cognitive data. That collection of that data violates the student and the family privacy and allows that sharing of data with anybody who feels they have a need to have it. Plan 2020 requires assessments that predetermine career paths. Plan 2020 requires all students to receive data-driven counseling in their personal and social development. 
Baptists believe that the God-ordained family is the rightful place for, for inculcating values and determining career paths. The unproven methodology required by Common Core is resulting in significant frustration and dissatisfaction from many students, parents, and teachers. There is little or no evidence that the level of student achievement would be raised by Common Core. Any sound method being applied in Alabama classrooms can be utilized without this uh, subservience to federal mandate. We urge the Alabama legislature to repeal Common Core and accompanying assessments and replace them with sound, proven, practical education and testing. The Alabama State Convention, November 11th, 2014. Gentlemen, the ball is in your court. Thank you. Elise Schultz, you're on deck, ma'am, and Ms. Williams, go ahead, please. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gail Williams, and I'm not going to talk about Common Core. Uh, I would like to speak on the issue of the lifetime ban on SNAP and TANF benefits for, con for, con for convicted drug felons who have served their time. As you know, SNAP and TANF is AFDC and food stamps. Um, it is being introduced as Senate Bill 303 by Senator Linda Coleman. I believe one in three prisoners in Alabama prisons are in prison for drug offenses. Many of these prisoners are women who have minor children and they're eventually going to get out of prison. Former drug felons who have paid their debt should be able to feed their families. This is particularly an issue for women who have minor children and are trying to re-enter the mainstream, get homes, return to work, and return to a no normal life. I can just only think about their children, you know, not especially the women, but food stamps and AFDC may be the only thing standing in the way of homelessness and foster care for their kids. Believe it or not, people in Alabama who have committed murder or committed rape or child abuse who serve their time for their offensive, offenses can get out of prison and get SNAP and TANF. But drug offenders who have served their time cannot. And, and that's hard for me to fathom. Only 10 states enforce the SNAP bans and 12 enforce the TANF bans at, th at this point for the felons who have served their times for drug offenses. So please don't let the state of Alabama be the last state once again, the last, to uh, lift the bans on SNAP benefits and TANF benefits for drug offenders who have served their time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, folks, we've got about 45 minutes left. We're moving along well. Uh, Ms. Schultz, you're, you're on. Uh, Mr. Dean Johnson, you're on deck. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you and good evening. I am here on behalf of the Huntsville chapter of the International Cesarean Awareness Network and myself as a mother. The excellent reputation and opportunities within atmospheric research attracted me to this beautiful area eight years ago. My husband and I have invested in this community for our careers and our family. Two and a half years ago, I gave birth to our son. It was not the birth I envisioned or the birth I intend to have again. My son was born under the bright, sterile lights in an operating room. Did you know that over 38% of births in our county are born this way? Over 35% in our state and 32% in our country. Some cesareans are absolutely necessary to save the life of mother or baby, but the rates are rising. According to the World Health Organization, C-section rates outside 10 to 15% can be dangerous and should be questioned. So what is causing such a high rate in surgical birth? If C-sections are saving more lives, then why have our infant mortality rate basically stalled over the last decade, while maternal mortality has risen by 136% in the last 14 years? We're going the wrong way. 
The World Health Organization stated in 2008 that the United States spends almost $700 million on unnecessary cesareans. Just think how much, of that, how much our state's contribution to that cost could be used for other programs, services, and projects within our state. Huntsville Hospital accounts for 78% of approximately the 6,000 births born each year in Madison County. Did you know that the current C-section rate at Huntsville Hospital is over 40%? That's at least 25% higher than the WHO guidelines. Because of the lack of complete birth st statistics, we do not know how many women have a trial of labor or are just going straight to the operating room. Why do we have complete in incomplete birth statistics? The first step towards improving Alabama's maternity care is updating the birth certificate form where more detailed vital birth statistics can be collected. Alabama uses the same form that was used in 1989. Since then, an updated form has been created and implemented in a majority of states. Updating this form could provide the statistics that will be a big piece towards understanding and improving Alabama's maternity care. I have learned how difficult it is to find providers who deliver in Madison County hospitals that are truly supportive of vaginal birth after cesarean and sometimes even natural birth. ACOG's less restrictive VBAC guidelines issued in 2010 made it clear that the evidence supports mothers wishing to have a trial of labor after a cesarean or two, yet many local providers and hospitals have policies and practices in direct contrast to these guidelines. Despite these guidelines and ACOG's push to lower cesarean rates, VBAC rates in area hospitals remain dismally low, leaving women desperate to avoid a surgical birth, so much that many are traveling with their tax dollars to Birmingham, Anniston, and Tennessee to receive the care they deserve. My freedom to birth, how I choose and where I choose, was taken away because I, came a, I became a resident of this great state. I ask you to do your part on helping women today and the next generation by recording better birth statistics and opening birth options in our state so that we can reduce unnecessary cesareans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Pippa Abston, you are on deck. And Dean Johnson, go ahead, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. I know most of you on the panel, not every one of you, but I do know most of you, and I appreciate this opportunity. We are perilously close to succumbing to tyranny with the radical left now controlling most levers of political and cultural power, using both in a relentless campaign to destroy the last vestiges of freedom in America. My parents were part of the greatest generation. That generation fought against fascism, socialism, Nazism, and won. And here we are today our state school board is trying to implement or is, has implemented a system of education called Common Core that would fit right in with Nazi Germany or some of these other socialist countries. It takes our God-given rights away from the parents, which the laws of nature and our Declaration of Independence calls for. The parents have the right and the responsibility to educate their children. It's taking that away from them and giving it to some bureaucrat in Washington, or maybe even the United Nations. This is a system of education that is something that is foreign to the United States. Are we, I understand that y'all are the legislators, and the state school board was set up by the Alabama legislature, and the Alabama Supreme Court has said the Alabama legislature has control over the state school board. So I'm calling on you as legislators to remove this cancer from our educational system. It's going to destroy everything that we care about in our country, regardless of which side of the fence you were on in the last session. And I understand some of y'all were probably for Common Core, hopefully because you weren't fully educated on it, because if you really understood what it was, I don't see how any red-blooded American, Republican or Democrat, independent or otherwise, could be for it. So please, step up to the plate in this new session of the legislature and repeal Common Core and restore the parents' rights to educate their children. It's a hideous system that will destroy our country if we aren't destroyed by some other evil force before then. But please, do your best and stand up 
and fight the power brokers down there in Montgomery and get the job done this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Is it Marla Pope? Ms. Pope, you're on deck. Go ahead, Ms. Hafsey. Hi. Um, I, I have met many of you all, and I, I appreciate getting this chance to talk to you again. I've enjoyed getting to know some of you over the last few years, and I've come to appreciate your sincerity, even when sometimes things take longer than we hope they do. Um, as you may know, I'm a pediatrician locally. I'm also the mother of a 25-year-old young man with severe chronic schizophrenia, and that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Um, the Department of Mental Health has uh, announced a surprise planned closing of North Alabama Regional Hospital in June this summer uh, with the civil commitment beds to be replaced by several smaller crisis units in our region. Over the past several years, we've had reductions in funding that have seriously degraded the availability and quality of care for persons with serious mental illnesses, and I've experienced that firsthand in my family. These are biological conditions of the brain. The state can't really justify the cost of failing to act, either in terms of human life or in terms of potential legal penalties, because the smaller units will be less expensive to operate and are eligible for Medicaid payments. The state will have a marked reduction in cost of care for our region. So what I'm hoping is that we will use these cost savings to develop all of our levels of care to the appropriate quality and availability. Delays or gaps in care are unacceptable. Serious mental illness must always be treated as a potentially life and brain tissue threatening condition. You may have heard the expression that doctors use for stroke patients. They say, time is tissue. And that same thing is true for the brain illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar. A delay in care can mean irreversible damage to the brain and function that can't be gotten back. Um, I have patients who try to get care and we have delays from them. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had a young lady who in my practice who was suicidal and we tried to get her admission and we're told the closest bed was mobile. Mm. Uh, and I think that's unacceptable. We do not have a child psychiatrist at our uh, county mental health center. No child psychiatrist, an adult board of psychiatrists is seeing children. And there is a difference. There is a complete disconnect at the Department of Mental Health. So I, I would like to beg you to help represent us because they are not listening to us. They think that um, our family members' needs are being met and they're just simply not. Um, we would like to ask you to help us get the Department of Mental Health to produce meaningful, accurate data regarding outcomes, uh, waiting times for all levels of care, rates of readmission to inpatient facilities, rates of homelessness for those with serious mental illnesses, rates of arrest and imprisonment uh, where people are put in jail instead of getting medical care. And accounting should be kept regarding how many persons do not uh, seek treatment or discontinue treatment, including medications due to cost barriers. We would like the system of oversight regarding state and local management of mental illness treatment resources and quality of care to be strengthened. The public, including persons affected by mental illness and their families, must have stronger means of appealing when met with inadequate care or denied services. We'll with go clear ahead and have provisions. to ask you to, to wrap up, oh, please. Sorry. Okay. I don't see the, the light yes, from where I am. Um, but in a manner similar to the appeals process for public educational services. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is it Julie, Miss Judy, Julie Moody Collins? Am I saying that correct? Okay, I just want I was looking for a spot. There you are. Yes, ma'am, you're, you're next. Go ahead, Miss Pope. Hi. Good evening. Um, to big piggyback on Pippa's um, comments, um, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Marla Pope, and I am um, North Alabama Coalition for Mental Illness Advocate. I am also a, um, a mother of a severe mentally ill adult child who suffers from bipolar 1 schizoaffective disorder whose disease is worsening as we speak due to the lack of insight of her illness. She's currently in a state of psychosis without medication. She and others like her are unable to recognize their own illness. As a consequence of the illness itself, patients like my daughter are subject to high risk of death 
or permanent loss of brain function. This is unacceptable to our family, our community, and ill patients who suffer from this. You see, serious ill patients with brain diseases suffer from psychosis. They cycle through hospitals, homeless, on the streets, and find themselves locked up because of behaviors associated with illness or lapses of care and medication. See, my daughter has been in jail three times, um, just in Huntsville in the last six months due to her psychosis, as a result of a premature release of inpatient care from here, from our um, uh, health system. As I tried to grasp and ma the maze of inadequate processes or assistance, I was on the only person that could file a petition to provide inpatient care for my daughter, which is really the only after she um, served her time in jail because of a false name provided to the officer who did not recognize she was in the state of psychosis. Jail is not where our sick children need to be. My family member who suffers from this brain disease and others like her cannot make a decision about their own care or understand the state of mind they're in. I'm here today to ask you to properly fund and use the outpatient commitment process, including safe housing and monitored administration of medication. Waiting for a threat of violence to self or others before providing treatment to severely ill persons is inexcusable, waste of human life and dignity. Treatment should be provided primarily for the benefit of ill person and not to prevent unpredictable acts of violence. There's no reason to wait for the illness to worsen to the point that violence becomes likely or readies in the, in the process. By the, this time, help is, is too late to, to even get. I'm here to advocate, advocate for widening the petitioners and not just the parent or spouse to ensure our loved ones are being treated for the illness and not as criminals. One more thing, while I'm speaking as an advocate for those who suffer I have a 29-year-old daughter, college graduate, has been in and out of jails, hospital, and homeless due to her illness for nine years. I brought my daughter to Huntsville hoping that she could get the adequate help for her illness. I discovered it was a maze of misinformation, processes, vague answers, and in the same line provided a local, I asked the lo local attorneys what I can do to get her outpatient care. They had told me that she must be a danger to herself or others. Well, that's too late. With our current system in place, there's no help for her unless our system changes. I do not know the qualifications of my daughter's doctors or therapists due to patients' rights. You go on the mental health center's um, website, there's no doctors listed or therapists listed and their qualifications. My daughter is in fa fantasy world. There's no one there to advocate for her and the system blocks me from getting involved. The police department... I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm almost you're finished. You're going twice your time and, 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 okay. and, and, and I'm very sincere in, in what you're relaying to us. It's very important to us but I, I need I've, to be I have two sentences faithful to the rest I'm of the finished. folks that are here. So please wrap up. Finished. Thank you. Okay, she's, um, the police department refuses to add her name to the system so when she is ever in full s state of psychosis, um, she, she's not sent to jail. I'm waiting for the next manic episode to occur when inpatient, when she has to go into inpatient. I tell you my story not to win your sympathy, but rather you support to ensure that those who have serious I um, illness um, are afforded the assistant outpatient court order treatment that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, we've got, we, we've got about 30 minutes left, and the math doesn't work with the number of people that we have left to speak, giving us three minutes. This is very important information that you're sharing, very passionate. I am going to ask you that you do hold to your three minutes based on the buzzer. 
give you a few more seconds to wrap up your thoughts. I will tell you that the legislators that are here will make themselves available, in particular, if you know, ma'am, the, the one that just spoke, if you know which legislator represents your area, that should be your conduit to begin a process. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to, to at least get the contact information and meet with that legislator. Uh, we do have legislators, as you heard during the, the opening comments, that literally have an hour drive back to their home tonight. And so we want to respect that as well. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Somerset, you're on deck. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Collins. My name is Julie Moody Collins, and I'm here about mental health, and um, that's why I included my maiden name, Moody. And statistically, three of y'all suffer from mental illness. I suffer from mental illness. My son suffers from mental illness. I could go on and on and on about the economic advantage advantages of treating it early, uh, the human advantages, but in order to save time, and since I have been able to have appointments with several of you, there's one specific thing I want from you. We want the money from the sale of the hospital, North Alabama Regional, to go directly for patient care in North Alabama. Not to the general fund, not to anything except patient care in North Alabama, period. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Somerset and uh, Mr. Collins, you're on deck, sir. Go ahead, Ms. Somerset. Okay. Good evening. My name is Angela Somerset, and my question this evening is in regards to HOAs or Homeowners Association. My question is, why has a bill not passed for HOA legislation, and if there is one, what is the status? There is a proposed bill according uh, to Representative Mac McCutcheon I have asked to see it in the last year. It has not been reproduced. I have proposed the inclusion of 28 items of which I also have today that I can attach. I would also like to see these items included and I have not received a response. I have also spoken with Senator Holtzclaw and communicated by email as well. The response that I received regarding my concerns in reference to HOAs and I quote, that is why I do not live in an HOA community. Yes, Senator Holtzclaw was a councilman for the city of Madison and was proactive for HOAs, which is also the area in which I actually practice medicine. I have spoken with everyone from the governor, Governor Bentley, who in writing states that he will support an HOA bill if our state representatives and senators can push the matter forward. I've spoken with our councilmen some of our state representatives and have made multiple attempts to meet and speak with Mayor Battle without success. There has been wonderful, wonderful support from many of you. The citizens of Alabama deserve protection under the law for their homes and their communities. Alabama has suffered enough in terms of bad publicity from a state and now from a federal level. Why can we not work together? Whether we are Republicans or Democrats, all of us have an interest in protecting our homes and our families. This matter can wait no longer. When we look back in history, what will the generation coming behind us say about us? What have we done or what have we not done? In summary, we talk about high taxes, but why are we having high taxes with no protection of our communities under the law? So basically my summary is one of accountability, transparency, as well as dual responsibility. Because in my eyes from this view, it works more in the favor of the developer, the declarant, and the builders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Somerset. Miss, I believe this says Jean Cox. Is that accurate? I'm having a hard time reading that. Is this correct, ma'am? I'm sorry? Ann Cox. My apologies, ma'am. Go ahead, Mr. Collins. Ms. Cox, you're on deck. That's kind of hard to follow. Uh, I'm going to try to not cover too much, too much of what... Uh, uh, Ms. Somerset said, but of course, I'm sure most of you are aware of my efforts to secure effective protective legislation for purchasers and owners in community associations. I've served on several state and real estate ta uh, commission task forces. Um, I've held uh, consumer and realtor training classes, produced newsletters, and, and promoted efforts through every available media, and here we are, five years later, 
well, more than five years, and we seem no closer at this point than when we started. Well-funded and well-organized special interest groups continue to lobby and promote for, uh, their for-profit members' interest rather than having a long overdue, a long overdue overhaul um, for consumer protection, nonprofit community associations' rights. Community association checkbooks are cash cows. Imagine just giving your checkbook to someone. You're obligated to put money into it, but you cannot see what they're using it for. Well, now the IRS is starting to take an interest in this. We're going to see more and more complaints starting to hit there. Um, a weak watered-down bill containing only what these groups are willing to allow is not the answer. There has to be account an accountability avenue other than through a civil process. Otherwise, just sue me will continue to be the response consumers receive from legitimate issues, from raising legitimate issues. Secondly, this is really a big one. Although the not quite a I don't I don't know if you can make one bigger than the other. Association managers must be licensed separately and regulated, like other professional licensees. The Alabama Real Estate Commission has no jurisdiction over realtors who hang their shingle and say, I'm going to be a community association manager. This is like the wild, wild west. Any of you can just hang your shingle and start managing all that money, doing what you want. Um, this really has become a real problem. Uh, I hope you're willing to secure a strong bill to affect these issues, to possibly affect these issues. And don't let these special interest groups continue to have their way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Jim and Cora Hall, you're on deck. And go ahead, Ms. Cox. I'm Ann Cox, and I thank you all for representing us. I look at you, and you're bright, and you look wise, and I know you're going to make the choices you need to. I'm standing here because I'm a, a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I graduated with an education degree. I taught for years before my husband and I started a family. We've lived in Huntsville for over 30 years now, and I've followed this city through. This is an important time. I've looked at the curriculum. I've looked at some of the tests. I've studied what's happening with Common Core. I've looked at who wrote the standards. I don't see educators there. I see money as a big issue. I'm really concerned. And I'm not just concerned because somebody said be concerned. I'm concerned because I've looked. I've studied it. I'm worried about our children. I really am. I'm worried about um, the way it'll teach them to think. I'm worried about the moral issues it will bring up. I'm worried about the way that test questions are worded. It's a concern. It really is. I look at the decision makers, the people who have, who've, the decision makers were not educators. I looked at the curriculum. I see a few people involved. I've read about David Coleman, different people that are mentioned, the test Who's going to make money on this? I'm not aware of a public debate that's really, really occurred about the pros and cons about this. Maybe there's been one, but I'm not aware of it. This all happened fast, and a lot was done in secret. I had a hard time finding what I really needed to know much about it. I'm involved in the medical community, too. Whenever we have a new drug, you heard about the marijuana, the medical marijuana, there's tests. You have to see how you go through years getting something accomplished. Every time we talk to a patient about a procedure we're going through, they have to know every complication that might occur. We haven't even thought about that with education. And these, this is the choice in our nation that we're working with. Abraham Lincoln has quotes. Every great person in this nation has made quotes about the importance of education. Please look at that. 
Marx was quoted a few minutes ago, and I was, I'm real concerned with history, too. I've really studied the history, and I'm concerned about it. Marx said, take the heritage away from a people, and they're easily persuaded. I pray that you'll think about this, that you'll look at it hard, that you'll repeal Common Core. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. <laughs> Mike Parsons, you're on deck. And go ahead, Ms. Hall. Okay. Gentlemen, <laughs> um, I'm, I've been told by my husband to keep it short, and you to keep it short. So um, I learned about Common Core about a year ago. I'm one of those mothers and grandmothers that uh, is passionate about getting it repealed. Everything, I ditto every one of the speakers. I, I, I kept awake last night thinking of speeches I could make and things I could say. I'm so grateful that they said them. But what I want to say is just my personal experience. I dug it into, into it myself to learn what it meant. And, and there are two words that come up. I was incredulous, I mean incredulous, about what I found out had come about, how it had come about. It was conceived illegally. It was promoted illegally and it's gonna be administered illegally, illegally. There's no legality behind the birth of this thing. And I, I urge you to repeal it. Thank you. Sweet. Mr. Mr. Parsons, you're, oh, I'm sorry, sir, you got, you got a few, did you reset? Go ahead, sir, if you'll make brief comments. Y'all, I didn't realize y'all were a twofer, uh, my apologies. <laughs> I lost my speech three years ago, but my mind is still good. We moved to Huntsville 36 years ago, and we were one of a handful of homeschool families. Since then, our three children went to college with scholarships. One of them is finishing his PhD right now, and the other two all went when Ten of our eleven grandchildren live in Madison County, and we're all opposed to common core. Our family contains eight voters in this county, and we're all opposed to it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. We're, thank you for being here. Okay, uh, David Pinkleton, you're on deck. Mr. Parsons. Thank you, Senator Hulsclaw. Uh, the uh, lights at my uh, right, 4 o'clock, I'd appreciate it. It's around your left, uh, 10 or 11 o'clock. If you'd let me know when I hit the bit of light, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank you, all of you for being here because you're very uh, putting yourselves out there where people can take shots, plus or minus on you, and I think that's a gutsy move for you all to come out here tonight and let the public speak to you. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to turn this around a little bit. Instead of trying to ask you to do something for me, I would like to offer to do something for each and every one of you. Uh, Mike Ball's already taken me up on it, um, and uh, Paul Sanford's taken me up. I'll make an offer to every one of you um, that should be germane, pertinent to your position because you are elected representatives that work for the people here and not the big money that seems to have a tremendous influence in Madison County. Uh, there's a lot of spin, a lot of talk about uh, this thing they call Common Core. What is it? Are we talking about standards? Are we talking about a transformation of our educational system? Uh, if so, what's the end run result? What are we going to have by this year 2020, five more years from now? Well, I will tell you that Common Core is alive and well in other places. Matter of fact, if you look over in Europe, countries like Italy, France, Spain, uh, London, England, that's where Pearson uh, has their headquarters, by the way. Uh, they actually named their educational models over there in Europe, and the education model those countries use is Common Core. Um, 
thing you need to realize is uh, you may have some information on Common Core, good or bad. If you've been listening to SPIN, you certainly have the plus side of it. But they are approving a lot of things administratively, and I doubt when they pass these things uh, over there at the State Board of Education that they're running over and telling you this will directly impact our education model design structure by the year 2020. I doubt they're doing that. The, um, uh, of course, um, they are also not going to talk to you about the tremendous educational funding that this uh, transformation is going to take, uh, that's going to cost you. And obviously the media is not trying to highlight it either, right? For various reasons. So I'm offering to come talk to you at your convenience with the facts. I'll bring Alabama's own plans, federal government documents. I'll bring the new plans that they're starting to come out or try to get approved. Matter of fact, on page two of that document that uh, we just handed you is exact quotes out of the new guidance counseling plan that they're trying to pass uh, that they uh, were going to bring up in December. Uh, for various reasons, they've postponed it. Now they're talking about bringing it up in April. Read that plan. That, that's a, I, I was bleeding while I cut it down to one page. You ought to see it. If you don't call it socialism, I, I give up. Uh, my time's out, so. I meant to tell you about that. I was yeah. trying to signal you okay, without being, all right, you know, all right, but all right. it didn't work. So. Bottom Seriously, line, uh, they are coming out with the counseling plan. Uh, I hope you don't think Common Core, the thing that we're talking about, the transformation of education system, is just an issue. You lose the education, issues like immigration, gun control, prisoner release, anything you can uh, want to mention is going to be a moot point in the later years. There's a lot of us getting smart on it. We're educating the public, and we want you. We know you're going to do the right thing. You're going to support the people and not the big money interests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Mr. Mr. Timberlake, Ralph Timberlake. Ralph didn't leave us, did he? No, he's here. Oh, I'm sorry. I see you didn't stand up, Ralph. I saw. Okay, go ahead, uh, Mr. Pingleton. Uh, Mr. Timberlake, you're on deck. Go ahead, David. Good evening. My name is David Pinkleton, and I'm a member of the Huntsville-Madison County Human Trafficking Task Force, and I'd like to begin by thanking Representative Hall for starring on our recent public service announcement that some of you may have seen on television, so thank you, Laura, very much. Human trafficking is the human rights issue we face today. Although slavery was abolished in the U.S. in 1865, slavery still exists in our country, and yes, it exists right here in Alabama. Sex trafficking of children is a brutal form of human trafficking and child sexual abuse. Experts estimate that as many as 300,000 children are at risk of exploitation and prostitution every year throughout the world. Alabama's human trafficking law went into effect on July 1, 2010. This law defines human trafficking as a Class A or B felony, outlines punishment for the crimes, and lists fines for those who violate the law. While prostitution of a child is a form of human trafficking under U.S. federal law, many states, including Alabama, still do not offer legal protections for minor victims. Often these victims are treated as criminals or delinquents, resulting in even more harm to the child. In the upcoming legislative session, the sponsor of the original state law, State Representative Jack Williams of Vestavia Hills, will be reintroducing a bill that will add a safe harbor provision to the existing human trafficking bill. The Safe Harbor Act will, number one, prevent minor victims of sex trafficking from being prosecuted for prostitution. These children are victims, not criminals. Number two, it will authorize the assessment of an additional fine for those convicted of crimes of promoting prostitution and certain other related crimes, with the fines being paid to a court-certified therapeutic counseling entity that provides education, treatment, and prevention counseling. And number three, this bill will also provide sexually exploited child victims with specialized services to treat their trauma and help restore their dignity. Human trafficking is a clear and present danger to Alabama and our local community. There have been numerous cases reported throughout Alabama in the past several years with those numbers increasing on a regular basis. Human trafficking crimes are heinous, traumatizing its victims and destroying their lives. The Huntsville-Madison County Human Trafficking Task Force has been working together with Representative Williams and the Alabama District Attorneys Association to ensure our children will be adequately protected by this proposed law. Tonight, we are asking for your help. When you are asked to vote on the Human Trafficking Safe Harbor Bill, we humbly request that you please vote yes to protect Alabama's youth from human trafficking crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now. It's 10 minutes till 9, and we've got eight speakers left. Even a Marine can figure out the math doesn't work. 
All right. Mr. Timberlake, uh, I'm going to ask you, and, and the other folks that follow, you, your comments are important to us. Please understand. But I am, am going to ask you to keep within the three minutes. And if you can go to two, we, we'd be happy. But go ahead, Mr. Timberlake. Uh, Mr. Harris, you're on deck. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present before this august body, particularly the citizens of this great state and nation. I'm here because I'm concerned about education as we talk about education. But I like to remind us that a great nation is known how it treats its fighters for freedom and justice. None of us have freedom and none of us have justice if no one fight for us. It is a shame and a disgrace that we talk about education, but we have two august bodies in the state here, I mean, the city of Huntsville, Alabama A&M and Huntsville, I mean, uh, UAH, who refuse to grant Purple Heart recipient veterans, men and women who have offered up almost a full measure, an opportunity to be educated so that they can continue their rightful place in this nation to continue to contribute at a higher level to this nation. There is no reason that I can think of to deny an, op an opportunity for education. While we talk about Common Core, while we talk about other avenues of education, but right here, our four-year institution to whom you fund each and every year, you allow them to deny our veterans an opportunity to receive. As a Purple Heart recipient, I can stand here and say that I have asked these, organiz these two entities, how do they, do they not honor this benefit to which is in our law? This is not a gift. This is something that the people like yourselves at one time in their wisdom thought that those who would offer up so much, who would lead their families and go and fight for you all, when I say you all, I'm speaking of all of Americans, an opportunity to continue their education and for these educational educators to sit in these administrative positions and deny these people is a shame and a disgrace. You know, it's nothing worse at, than to have a false friend. You know, they're worse than a real enemy. And I say that in, a friend is someone who gives to you and your enemy is someone who withholds from you. Now, I come each year almost and ask you about my other pet peeve, and that is transparency. Huntsville Hospital is still allowed to be in the dark in some of its meetings. If you would, go back and revisit the Health Care Act uh, for the Huntsville Hospital and see that their committee meetings are allowed to be open to the public. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Timberlake. Stanley Brockway, you're on deck. Mr. Harris, go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Eric Harris. I, well, I'm a citizen of this good county, and um, I just wanted to take a second and say you've heard a lot of things, Common Core. You've heard about HOA issues. You've heard about um, human trafficking. you also heard about the midwifery, things like that. And there's a lot of things that these citizens, that we all have complaints and things asking for you all to do. I'm going to reverse that, and I'm going to ask you, what, what can I do for you? Um, I've worked for a lot of different organizations, Bank of America, including as well as some other things within the government, and they've mentioned systems that need to be in place. They've mentioned processes as far as technology that needs to be in place to track things such as a payday lending and things like that sort. I'm willing to do that for free because it needs to be done, and I'm willing to do it now. I'll quit my job because those things serve our community. And I know that if you do those things and you put those things in place from a legislative perspective, that the funding that you may need to get it done, if someone's giving it to you for free, I don't see why that's an issue. So I'm willing to put that on the table, and I'll be putting in the minutes for it, that I'm willing to offer to do that for free to help get things that need to be done for this community done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your offer. I would, I would encourage you. To, I, I don't know who your legislators are, but I would encourage you to contact your Senate and House representatives that are hopefully present here this evening. Um, I'm going to have a hard time reading this. Is it Hillman? Somebody help me. Hillman Chu? William. William. My apologies, sir. William. What's, let's say the last name, please. Chu. Chu. So I did get that right. Okay, excellent. You have my handwriting, sir. 
Uh, Mr. Brockway, you you're on. You go ahead, sir. And Mr. Chu, you're on deck. Stanley Brockway, I'm living uh, districts of Senator Sanford and Representative Sanford. Uh, I'd like to put things on a little bit lighter note uh, this evening and talk about raising taxes for a little bit. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Chuck Bedane brought this up much earlier this evening. Uh, I was glad to see uh, Governor Bentley bite the bullet, and he's going to show us next week and you next week uh, what his ideas are on getting the revenue up closer to our needs in the state. Uh, one thing, I'm a member of Alabama Rise, and I'm going to, I'm not talking for them. I'm riding on their coattails. They, they put some good information together. This is a two-pager. Uh, Chuck main mentioned earlier, and Rise has been talking about it for probably decades, is the unbalanced, the the regressive tax system in the state. And I think there's one way that you can kind of kill two birds here uh, is working, possibly eliminating the federal tax deduction in the state. It would do, it would raise money, it would, it would slip the balance in the progressive direction because the lower, uh, less able to pay people won't, aren't stuck, are not paying this, are not taking advantage of this deduction. And the, those of us, I don't pay any state taxes. We have such a, a generous system here. I have defined benefit retirement. I contribute a lot to charity. I don't, I don't, they owe me money. I have a, last year I, I sold a bunch of stuff in 13, so I had to pay some state taxes for the first time in a decade or so. But I think that's a real good place to, to look to get some money and that won't be hurting the people who can take being hurt the least. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heather Jacoby, you're on deck. Go ahead, Mr. Chu. Thank each of you for taking time to listen to the consti your constituents' concerns. I'm here to talk about the, my concern for the great lack of professional psychiatric care in the state of Alabama. I know this because my daughter, when returning to Huntsville, we needed to get a, a, a psychiatrist. She was refused by five oh, psychiatrists because they already had full, uh, uh, were full. Sorry. We then went to, to the county uh, center and it took us six weeks before she could see the first psychiatrist. I have three points that I would like uh, to make. The first is because of the Alabama's reputation in the psychiatric community nationwide, we have a large lack of psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists. Nobody wants to come to Alabama because other than South Carolina, everybody else is better, so why come here? So I urge that we find a creative way to attract professional healthcare people to the state of Alabama. This could be done uh, by having some kind of financial incentives. It also can be done by uh, changing laws so that there is uh, re reciprocity in the medical licensing and credentials of doctors that are fully licensed and credentialed in other states so that they can come and practice here. The second point is that all health care facilities, whether they be outpatient or residential or inpatient, 
need to be appropriately certified, credentialed, and staffed to maintain uh, appropriate quality services. Uh, at present, there are a number of non-accredited and faith-based programs that are being that uh, uh, are receiving state-funded or mandated treatment instead of credentialed facilities. The third point is that uh, health insurance uh, insurers should be directed to approve primary care uh, providers, family doctors for treatment of the less complicated mental illness. This then uh, 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 conserves the scarcer resources for those who need it. Uh, and th this includes a uh, primary care telephone access lines for uh, doctors to call to, for consulting uh, uh, psychiatrists uh, uh, who, who have uh, answers. Thank you. Thank, very thank much. you, sir. I, I can't tell if it's Terry or Jerry Burnett. Is it Terry or Jerry? Jerry, Mr. Burnett. Okay, you're on deck, sir. Mr. Jacoby, go yes, ahead. Sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Strickland Jacoby. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'd like to thank you in advance for your attention to a very important uh, matter that's facing this community, this town, and um, the whole state of Alabama. Um, it is a moral issue, it's a tax issue, and its implications. Uh, range from homelessness to our prison system. Um, so it's very far reaching and it does affect each tax paying citizen. Um, because our current system has failed, persons with serious mental illness are often put in jails or state prisons for actions they committed as a result of their untreated illness. This is similar to arresting a seizure patient, seizure patient for knocking over a display stand while falling in a seizure and it's unacceptable. It's straining our state and local resources. In addition, people with serious mental illness within the prison and jail system are receiving highly inadequate care, which puts law enforcement and jail personnel in a position of serious liability. The state and local justice systems must ensure that inmates with serious mental illness are identified promptly upon entry into the system, that their medications are continued without interruption, and that treatment be promptly initiated for persons who are in need of medication. Contact must be made with the person's current health care providers and necessary records for continuity of care obtained as permitted under the federal privacy rules. Upon discharge, the same provisions as hospital discharge must apply. The person must have medication, not just a prescription, and a follow-up appointment with a psychiatrist scheduled, as well as safe and appropriate housing. These things are not happening now. Outpatient or inpatient commitments from the jail and prison system must be sought when needed to the same degree and for the same indications as non-inmates, just as other elements of medical care. As the former president, board president of our local drop-in center for adults suffering from mental illness, we have veterans, we have former employees of the technology age, the various agencies here. We have young people that have just recently been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, I've seen these the implications to to our community. Uh, one young lady named Quana was a transplant here from California, and she was homeless. She was staying with various people, most of whom she did not know. When I took her to the, she was medication complicit, which is an issue that is usually a, a struggle for people with mental illness. But here we had someone willing to be medication complicit and we took her to the mental health center and she was told to come back in however many months her appointment was going to be in and they told us to go to the emergency room well we did and the emergency room told us to go to the mental health center so here we had somebody willing to get in, and stay in treatment who ended up in jail because of her psychosis that eventually ensued as a result of not having her medication i work with the homeless mentally ill as well and this happens over and over. And as I stated before, this is a moral issue. This is an economic issue. And I would appreciate any attention that you could give this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Paige Marlin. Miss Marlin. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. I was just trying. You're on deck. Uh, Mr. Burnett, you're 
about to speak, and for the remainder, uh, just so the, my colleagues understand, there's one more person after that. So we have three people, including Mr. Burnett. Go ahead, Mr. Burnett. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'll be brief. Uh, but first, I want to ask you a question. I know that some of the same issues are coming up. Like uh, for four years in a row, I know that that uh, low that um, uh, payday loan, prime payday lending stuff. Yeah, because I brought that up. And then I noticed every year since then it's been coming up. So it made me wonder, are you just sitting there listening as a common courtesy or do you take what we say here serious? And, and I'll just share with you, I personally worked on that legislation for three years. I wish it would pass as easy as some folks like to think it would pass. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. But now I wanted to talk about poverty uh, in the community and coast statewide because, uh, you know, as a, a position I serve in as a, as a, for the Alabama State Conference, NAACP, I move across the state and I see poverty. And I know that Alabama has a long history of poverty go going all the way back to s Reconstruction. And, and I wonder why is it that Alabama has such long history of poverty when they always get their fair share of federal funding and uh, we have natural resources and uh, I wonder what is the problem. It's it must be at the state level. Somebody's not making good decisions. Uh, something is wrong. For to have Alabama has gone back since Reconstruction and been almost in the top ten it, ever since then. That's, something is wrong. And and I want to say something about the affordable health care. And uh, I notice uh, Alabama has declined on the affordable health care. And the statistics show that the affordable health care would provide some $12 billion in federal funding for the state of Alabama for services. And also, uh, in Alabama, between 97 and 136 deaths occur per 100,000 residents <coughs> because they don't have access to health care. So if you reject the affordable health care funding, and we got 100 people dying per 100,000, what do you plan to do about the, don't you care about the lives of these people? And uh, also research has proven that, it, uh, it's concluded that it would provide over 30,000 jobs. It, 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 do you have a, a better plan? Then show it to us. Uh, do you have research that prove that the affordable health care is not what it said it is, you know, because I don't see any uh, evidence. All I hear is words when you say, well, it's a bad bill. Well, show me it's a bad bill. I got the research saying that it's a good, good bill, but show me that it's a bad bill. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Burnett. Uh, Deborah McKay. Ms. McKay, you'll be our last speaker this evening. Ms. Marlin, go ahead, ma'am. Apologize, I had a printer problem tonight. <laughs> I'd like to thank each one of you for listening to us speak tonight about our failing mental health system here in Alabama. These issues are so very important. I am Paige Martin, and I represent myself, a person who has a brain disorder. It's called Major depress Depressive Order. And my family, all of which have been affected by mental illness. And the North Alabama Coalition for Mental Illness. That's who you're hearing from tonight. It's NACMI, and I expect you're probably going to be hearing a lot more about us in the coming months. I'm tonight going to speak about a particular set of people with brain disorders and it is the ones who are indigent, homeless, usually without insurance, and most often medically frail. I ask that you keep these people in your imagination while I talk about the following issues. When persons with serious mental illnesses are di uh, discharged from hospitalization or civil commitment, continuity of medical treatment is absolutely essential and any lapses are life and brain threatening. Because of this, initial supplies of medications, immediate outpatient appointments to continue care w at least within two days, and secure safe housing must be arranged in advance. 
discharging a person whose life depends upon psychiatric care without ensuring the availability of an appointment or medication is like sending a ventilator dependent person home with no ventilator. This condition cannot be considered stable. For persons without insight, which is the population that I'm talking about, outpatient commitment should be sought prior to discharge as part of appropriate standard care of a treatment, care of treatment. Presently, Hospitals are sending homeless persons to local shelters by taxi without previously arranging for a bed or transition of care. On top of that, the people at the shelters have no idea how to safely care for persons with the most serious illnesses. This constitutes patient abandonment and is not only unethical, but is a liability risk for all of the agencies who are trying to deal with the mentally ill. That includes our police force, um, sheriff's departments, uh, mental health hospitals, mental health centers, and our hospitals. The state must determine a mechanism to, uh, to coordinate provision of services and to communicate effectively between these agencies. Um, in conclusion, I would like to thank you again for listening to each one of our examples of the failing mental health system. We cannot continue to pretend, pretend that the mentally ill do not exist, and we must together find new ways to implement laws that are, in fact, already in place on our Alabama books. They're already in place. They're just not being followed right now. And, um, but instead, we, ne we need to improve the overall entire mental health system. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. McKay. Hello. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be the last person to speak. Uh, I have met a lot of you uh, and uh, had an opportunity to speak with a few of you. But I'm here to support my friends. And please don't exit the room when I tell you that I'm here to talk about Common Core. But I want to tell you something from a different uh, perspective. Um, I'm a mother of three boys. My boys are ADHD, LD students, and I married a man, I was married to, to my husband for 38 years, who grew up in the country, and I'd, I had never heard this said before, but his classroom consisted of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, which just seemed bizarre to me. I couldn't imagine that one teacher taught all these different grades. But the reason I'm saying this and the reason I decided to come tonight and share all of this with you is for those people in here who we're wanting you to start catching our spirit of this common core is for those people in here who have LD kids. Those, maybe you might have heard the term used special ed children. Well, I'm one of those mothers of these types of children. They have high IQs. They just learn differently, but they're smart, good kids, and they have grown up to be very good, productive young people. And because I was married to a man who grew up in the country, he didn't believe in private schools, and all of our kids went to the local city school, uh, Whitesburg Middle, Jones Valley Elementary, Huntsville High, until my third child and we stopped. We stopped. And I'm going to tell you why. My children were given a test in their younger years as to what they are qualified for when they get older. And I'm hearing this echoed on Common Core, and I just can't stand behind and not say something. They told them that they could do certain types of jobs, which I know that they would have been able to, but they weren't positive that they could be college graduates. Now, for any mother in here who's helped their kids get through college, I've done the research work for my kids' term papers, research papers. All of us have done things to try to help them. But my boys grew up in a home where their father and mother believed in education, and we believed in helping them do whatever was necessary to be able to get through school. There was no option. You went to college. You had to produce. You had to be a productive citizen. Mom and dad are not going to keep that umbilical cord connected for you. There was no option. 
Common Core, I'm here to tell you, as a mother, I had IEP meetings, and I had a say. And though a teacher said he was not going to do any more than what they thought he did, I proved them wrong because their father and I believed in them and we worked with them. I'm here to tell you, please, stop what you're doing and take a good look at what's happening because the way to stop a ticket is not get the ticket to begin with. Once it's done, it's done. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, on, on behalf of my colleagues, we thank you for being here this evening. We're adjourned.